Well, good morning, church. I uh, trust you have already been able to uh, worship the Lord in singing and through Sunday school, uh, that uh, you have been able to just surrender to Christ and praise Him and worship Him for everything that He has done in your life. I'm uh, so thankful when we always can worship so uh, great in singing and just through prayer, thanking the Lord. This morning, I invite you, if you want to follow along in Scripture, to the book of Galatians, chapter 1. If you are in our second message, we started last Sunday. It was more of an introduction, and today we will continue. And uh, I also just want to invite you, uh, this next month, we have several guest speakers, so they will probably speak on different topics. But when we are in this series, feel free to read at least once or twice uh, through the book of Galatians. It will help you tremendously to get more out of it. And the reason for this entire sermon series could be summed up in two words, and that is gospel clarity. And I don't know what this message will do to you this morning, but I can assure you that I have been richly blessed, encouraged, convicted, motivate it through studying it. And I, my prayer is that it will do the same for you. You know, when I study a message and it just speaks to me and the Holy Spirit reveals truth to me, and it, then I somehow like to believe it will do the same to others. And I just trust that it is going to happen to you as well. You know, it's gospel clarity. We want to know what exactly the true, pure, life-changing, life-giving truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ really is. I mean, if he can't get this clear, then nothing else would really matter. So my prayer is that this will be deep into God's Word, that it will be powerful by the Holy Spirit, and that if there's something that we may have not understood before or had not clarity of or may have drifted away from, that God is just going to do an explosive revelation in our hearts and show us true gospel clarity. And here's the thing. It doesn't matter how long you have been a Christian, gospel understanding and gospel clarity can easily be lost. What I mean by that is that many times other things, they can cluster our minds and our hearts and our lives and we really forget about the gospel even when we think we have it all. We may become so focused on what it means to be a good leader. And if you are a church leader, you want to be the best leader. I get that. But we could get so focused on that I'm going to focus on I'm going to be the best leader I possibly can. Or we get so focused on I'm going to be the best parent. Or are we getting so focused on I'm going to be the best spouse or the having the best marriage? Or are we going to have the, the, the best impact in the world? And listen, those are all good things, of course. But sometimes we can get so focused on things like that that we slowly drift away from the true gospel of grace. We just aren't paying a lot of attention sometimes. Maybe sometimes we are like these two old guys. They were in a rest home, and one day they decided they were going out for a walk. And here comes a woman walking by them completely naked. And the first guy says, did you saw what she was wearing? And the other guy says, no, but whatever it is, it need ironing. You know, paying attention, right? Paying attention. Uh, sometimes we don't pay attention, and sometimes we, we, we may don't, are even caring so much about it. And so Paul here in Galatians, he wants to clear this up for the Galatians. The gospel, let me just say it at first, the gospel is the good news that God, who is more holy than we can imagine, he looks up on us with compassion, or he looks up on people, who are more sinful than we are actually willing to admit. And then he sent Jesus to establish his kingdom and to reconcile people to himself. 
Jesus, whose love is more than we can even measure, came to sacrificially die for us so that by his life, death, and resurrection, we might gain, through his grace, eternal life. The gospel is an announcement of what God has done to save sinners. So, what do we do with this good news? We share it. We proclaim it. We declare it. That's what we're called to do with good news. When we receive good news, we pass it on because that's what good news does. And you know what the good news is? makes it so uncomprehensibly good, it's rooted in God's grace. Grace is receiving something you did absolutely not earned or deserved or maybe even not even expected. That's grace. It's kind of like if I would go and give somebody a thousand dollars he didn't earn it, he didn't deserve it, he didn't even expect it. That's grace. So my prayer is that the gospel clarity will be as clear this morning as it possibly can get, and very possible maybe even as clear as you have never heard it before. So I'm going to start off with a question. And if you are note-takers, you definitely want to write notes today because there's going to be plenty of opportunities. First question is, what does the gospel require? You know, there's a lot of ministries today, they say the gospel requires faith. Believe, believe, and you're saved. Which faith is true, but the gospel requires faith and repentance. The scripture is filled with that, faith and repentance. It's all over the scriptures. Jesus says this in Mark chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. Jesus says, after John was put in prison, he talks about John the Baptist. Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. And then in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Jesus had just ascended to heaven. And now the, the disciples had just received the Holy Spirit, and so they were preaching. And then Peter says this, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then you go down to Acts chapter 17, verse 30, and here the apostle Paul is preaching. And this is what he's preaching. He says in Acts chapter 17, 30, In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. So when you hear the gospel, you understand the gospel, it demands a response. It demands a human response. It is faith. Believe, 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 believe. And then it also demands repent, 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 repent. That's what it, the gospel teaches us. So when we believe the gospel, we, we, we recognize, when we are exposed to the gospel, we recognize that we are filthy sinners. That we are sinners by nature, we are sinners by choice, and we recognize that we deserve that which a holy and a just God must give for sin. And that is His wrath. That is damnation. Repentance is realizing when you repent, you realize, I'm a miserable, hopeless sinner. And then because you repent, you begin hating your sins. You become totally disgusted by your sins. You realize that you deserve to be condemned. You don't deserve to be in the presence of a holy God. And then in repentance, you know, we change our minds. We change our minds about our sins. We now hate it. We now want to get away from it. 
you know what, this may be different for you than it is for me. But for me, I have zero interest in sharing my testimony and sharing with you all the nastiness and the miseries and the disasters of my sins I have committed in my life. I have no desire. Why? I'm disgusted by that. I'm, a, I'm ashamed of that. I want to get away from that. I, I rather, for me, I rather share a testimony of how the gospel was shared with me, how I came to Christ, how he saved me by faith and repentance. I, I rather share a testimony of what Jesus has done in my life, what he's doing in my life today. But that is just me. I'm not discrediting if you do it differently. I'm just saying that as when we repent, we want to get away from our sins. If you're disgusted by them. We don't want to just brag about them all the time and every day because it's, it's a shame. Repentance and faith is, is really like a two side of the same coin. Repentance is turning from sin. I want you to pay close attention. This will really bless you and help you to get to this and understand this. First of all, I want to say, have you noticed, low German Bible readers, that there isn't a word repentance in a low German Bible? I mean, I haven't actually done a deep research, but the verses that I looked up, not a single word verse will have a word for repentance in low German. I know in high German they have a word, but low German there isn't a word. The only thing, every time the Bible that I looked up, where it says repentance in English, the Lord German Bible says, turn away from sin, or turn around, or turn away. So, and that's actually exactly what repentance means. The Lord German word just doesn't have a word for that one word. Repentance means this, you turn away from your sins. Okay? And faith, faith means that you turn to and trusting in and relying on Jesus Christ. So when there is coming to Christ, there is faith and repentance. So you believe, you turn to Christ, and you turn away from sin. So that is... So to say that we respond to the gospel, we believe, we repent, we get saved. This is required for anybody who wants to be saved. And if you are not saved today, January 23rd, 22 is a great day to get saved. The next question that I want to ask, now that you are saved, you have repent it, you turn from sin, you have believed, you believe you turn from sin, and now what does the gospel produces? Now that you're saved, what is it that the gospel produces? It produces obedience to God's commands. 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 through 5 says this, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is what? Is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Wow. This is how we know we are in Jesus. We have salvation. Because we keep his commands. If we, if we say we have Jesus, but we don't keep his commands, he says, you're a liar. And he says that, and now if you do this, the love for Christ has been truly made complete in us. So, Obedience is the evidence that you love God and believe the gospel. That's evidence of that. And listen, folks, now it gets much better. I, I don't know. This is just excites me. This is awesome. 
even desire and power to obey God are the gifts of grace. Look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. For God is working in you. Now those that are now saved, God is working in you. So what kind of a work is God doing in us? Giving you the desire, the desire to do what? And then also the power and the power to do what? To do what pleases Him. Wow. Again, the evidence that Christ is living in you and you have believed the gospel, that you have truly repented of your sins, is that you now have a desire and, and you have a power to do what pleases God. That is so amazing because the truth is it is not natural to obey God. It's supernatural. And now you don't have a desire to do the opposite that, that, please, that is not pleasing to God, but you have now the desire to do what God wants you to do, to do what the Word of God says you should do. And not only do you have the desire, you have the power to do it. It's in you. Now, what does that mean? I mean, you can do like an inventory of your own life. A am I just describing your life here this morning? I hope I do. I hope that is what you are, that you are saved through believing the gospel, through repentance, and that you are now obeying his commands because that is what the gospel produces, and that you have this desire and that you also apply the power that is within you available to do what pleases God. That, that means we obey God's word. Not just know it, but we do it. We, we, we actually live it out. That means that, that we do forgive people that, that, that do us wrong. We forgive them. Because we have the power to do it and we have the desire to do it. That, that means we, we are not people that hold grudges against people or walk around them because we don't want to face them. No, if you're not guilty toward them because we have forgiven them. And, and the list could go on and on. You know, if we were before cheaters or liars or cursors, we, 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 we all of a sudden, we change all of that. Because we have now that desire, and we also have the power to do what pleases God. Last week, I, I was trying to help you understand what's on the other side. That was the introduction. So that we would get the most out of once we would look at Paul's side. Many times in the Bible, we get only one side of the telephone call, so to say. Like even the Corinthians and here the Galatians, there is something that comes to Paul and there's a history of it. And often we don't know the side so much, but we only, only know the other side of it. Have you ever been in the situation where you, uh, you hear the one side of a phone call and you're just thinking what's on the other side, but you may not know the full story of it? I'm sure the trucker dispatchers, their wives should know that. Because they hear their husband on one side, but they don't know exactly what's on the other side. Interestingly, Elena and I, when we went to Bolivia uh, back in September, we walked down the hallway to a different terminal in the airport. And here's a guy walking right next to us. And this guy is talking out loud on his phone. And we knew exactly what on this, was going on on this side of the phone. But we were not sure what exactly all was going on, on the other side. But one thing we knew, on this side of the phone, he was breaking up with his girlfriend or with his wife. I'm not sure, one of the two. And he was rude and mean. And we were assuming on the other side somebody was really bagging and, and wanting to, to ease him and, and not breaking up with her. But, but sometimes we have that. And so the Galatians is, is actually kind of like that. And that's why last Sunday was the introduction of, and so I want to recap just a little bit of last Sunday, just so we don't lose the full meaning. Paul, on his first missionary journey, he went through the southern Galatia. He was winning hundreds and hundreds of the Gentiles with the gospel of grace. And he also established churches in the cities. But just as these, these young Christians were established in the freedom of faith, 
some of these Judaizers, the, the Jewish teachers from Jerusalem church, they come and they try to deceive them. And basically they said, you got Jesus and that is great and that is awesome, but you cannot fully have salvation and assurance of salvation. And last, you're also uh, accompanied that with the Old Testament law and especially circumcision was at stake. And so they, they, they tried to deceive them uh, and, and say, you have to convert to Judaism. You have to become a Jew in order to be truly a child of God. And this attack was powerful and persuasive. And these young believers, they were focusing on understanding what exactly makes a person right with God. And so now Paul writes them the letter and just reminds them again and gives them the clarity again of the true gospel of grace. And let me uh, read in, first, uh, in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. And then we'll look through that. It says, Paul says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to believe in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one who we preach to you, let him be under God's curse. As we have said it already, now I will say it again. Anybody who is preaching to you a gospel other than what you have accepted, let him be under God's curse. First, I want you to look at verse 6. The word deserting. Let me just read verse 6 again. He says, I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Deserting means intentionally changing sides. These churches have been taught this wonderful, life-changing, eternity-altering gospel of grace. And now less than a year, they are ready to get rid of the gospel of grace for a change to a religion of legalism. He says, you used to be in bondage, and now you have been freed, and now you are going back into bondage. And he says, when you turn to a different gospel, to an opposite gospel, then you are having a gospel that is really not a gospel at all. Listen, folks, if you have ever depended on anything Beyond the grace of God to be saved, the grace of God, the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ to make you right with God, and you have dependent on something else to be saved, you have deserted God. You are believing a different gospel. It's a gospel that has no power to save. And then I want you also to see the, ver the, the word in verse 7 where it says pervert, to pervert the gospel. Let me read verse 7. It says, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. The, the, the word pervert literally means to turn around or to reverse order. And so I think really it was a reverse order. Because the gospel of the good news of grace of God is Christ, his life, death, and resurrection. It always starts there. It starts with faith, believe. It starts there, and then it always ends what it produces. And it produces obedience. So now, if you have that, you first believe, and then it produces obedience and you reverse that order, what do you get? Now you get legalism. Now you get first, it starts with your good works. It starts with the gospel of good works, your good deeds, your good attitude. And really, it's the gospel of legalism then. In other words, you, you start them with a gospel. If I'm going to do enough good and I'm just going to try hard enough, maybe I will do so much good that God will save me for it. And you have then reverse the, the gospel order. That's exactly what these uh, teachers were trying to do. They were trying to reverse the gospel order 
And Paul says, when you reverse the gospel order, you don't have a gospel at all. There is only one gospel of grace, and you cannot reverse it or change it or turn around with it and make it a valid gospel. It starts with Christ and Christ alone. I was thinking this week about many of those false gospels that are all around us. And I want to mention a few to you, and I, I trust that it will bless you and help you to truly, fully understand gospel clarity, the gospel of grace. One is that the gospel are in areas reversed, and people literally think if you do good, you try hard, you do your best, maybe God will save you through that, that you may one day will somehow be able to slip into heaven. The idea of a scale, maybe the good will just be outbalancing the bad and you will get tipped into heaven. It's a reverse gospel, and Paul says that's not a gospel at all. Now there is also what I would call the prosperity gospel. This prosperity gospel is preached on television and radio by host of false prophets, and they will tell you this. If you will send a lot of money to our ministry, then God is going to bless you with more money. And then when you send them a bunch of money, they laugh all the way to the bank. This is a prosperity gospel. God is seen as a divine vending machine. You put in faith and out pops blessings, money, homes, cars, Wealth and health. That's what's been preached. God exists to make you healthy and wealthy. This is years ago. I wasn't even a pastor here at this church at the time. I was a church board chairman. But I listened to a television preacher, and he could preach so good. Very convincing and persuasive. And, you know, I mean, he just had your attention. One of the greatest speakers you could imagine. And I didn't know the pastor at that time. And I listened to this sermon. And then later on, I found out that there were some people from this church that had also listened to the exact sermon. And they had completely and totally believed, and they fell right into that trap. But this is what the pastor preached. And it's very persuasive, very convincing. He said when him and his wife were young, they would often drive through this one neighborhood that was a very nice, fancy, modern, rich neighborhood. Houses that were worth millions of dollars. And his wife had told him, I would love to live in one of these houses in this neighborhood one day. And I told my wife, he said, just have faith. You just believe and believe and believe. And if you will believe hard enough and long enough, and you just stick with it, God will one day give it to you. And this is what the pastor said. And guess where we are living today. And people buy into it. It's very convincing, very persuasive, especially when you bring it across that way. And I think the people that listened to him, they knew that they lived in, in a mansion of $17 million worth. I think they knew all that. But then people buy into that. That's a prosperity gospel. It's a false gospel. And Paul says, then you don't have a gospel at all. Here's one that maybe some of us have even been guilty of. Or maybe even never have truly understood this and have clarity on it and we actually have committed these things. Uh, you might want to write this down. I call it the deal of the day gospel. You ever heard of it? It's a deal of the day gospel. I mean, the message of the gospel is that we ought to make and be able to make deals with God. You just make a deal with God. It's usually recognized by prayers like, God, if you will get me out of this mess, I will give my life to you. Or, God, if you're going to heal me, I will serve you faithfully forever. Or sometimes it could be a, a bargain. You know, it's, it's like, this, this, this bargain mindset. God, if you will just let me have this job, or, or God, if, if you will just let me 
make a good deal here. Or, or God, if you're just going to let me win the lottery, or, or God, if you're going to let me date this guy, or, or if you're going to let me marry this woman, uh, then I will serve you forever. And then, in their eyes, when God doesn't keep his end of the deal, which, by the way, God never made a deal with them to begin with, but when God doesn't, in their eyes, doesn't keep his end of the deal, they bail on God. It's the day of the deal gospel. And, and you know what? Not only that, if they actually get exactly what they were praying for, Almost every single person, because it's not a true gospel, within a year, they'll get used to it, they'll get comfortable, whatever they prayed for, and they bail on God anyway. And it makes sense because you cannot bargain with your creator, and the deal of the day gospel is a false gospel. And then there is a gospel, I would call it a little bit of this and a little bit of that. There are people that literally will pick certain areas of religions and certain areas of scripture and then they will say this with a fist this is what i believe if you want to make your own belief and your own religion you better also make your own heaven because you're not going to span in god's but if you want to span in god's heaven you have to believe the gospel of grace, the true gospel, because that's the only way. Now, there is also the convenience gospel. It's kind of like a presto gospel, right? Just a convenience, and then you can go on again. Or, I didn't know how to explain this, so I'm going to explain it quite strange. I call it a gospel, no, yes, a gospel light. They have a gospel light. So, <laughs> I saw this somewhere uh, on, a, on, a, on a little post, and I thought it was very funny. So, I'm just going to use the same. Uh, if, if you're a beer drinker, you know what, what light means. You know, you have a beer, it's called, I don't know what it's called, let's say it's called Keystone. You have a beer, it's called Keystone. That's the real beer. And then you have the Keystone Light. That's the milder version of the real deal. So it's no longer the real deal. Get it? So that's what I'm saying is when I say there's churches in America that have a gospel light. I mean, it's a gospel light where sin and repentance is seldom mentioned or preached because if you would, you might offend the listener. And you don't want to do that as a pastor. I mean, you just want to make people feel good about themselves and feel good about their lives and feel good that they are doing the best that they can. But dragging somebody down by making them feel convicted about their own sins and their lives or giving them a burden for the lost to share with them, I mean, you just don't want to make people uncomfortable. It's a gospel light. If you are going to be a genuine, real Christian, the Bible says you have to be willing to deny yourself, pick up your cross daily, and follow Jesus. That's the gospel of grace. That's the real gospel. And if you are not careful and diligent to know the real gospel, things like this can creep into our thinking. We should never add or subtract to uh, the true gospel. Because if we do, we will lose it. Paul says to these folks, you need to get back. You need to get back and claim and declare and affirm and emphasize the gospel of grace. You are drifting away. Look at verse 8 and 9. He says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be under God's curse. As we have already said, I now say it again. If anyone is preaching to you a gospel other than what you have accepted, let him be under God's curse. Paul would never, an angel from heaven would never 
come and preach a different gospel besides the one of grace in Jesus Christ. But the, the point is clear. No matter how good or how godly a messenger may appear, if his gospel does not line up and square up with the God-given gospel of being saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, then don't believe it. Then if you add or subtract, don't believe it. The truth is always more important than the speaker's persuasive, motivational speaking. The truth is more important than that. And so we need to hold on to the truth. The Bible says if there is this persuasive, motivational preacher, but he doesn't preach the truth of the real gospel of grace, let him be cursed. Very strong language. It literally means let him go to hell. We claim, declare and affirm and emphasize that the only gospel that can free anybody from sin, make them right with God, is only through Christ. His life, death, and resurrection. Every other gospel is not the gospel at all, which leads people away from the truth. And Paul says they can go to hell. The Bible uses two times the word curse with the meaning let them go to hell. The one is if you teach a false gospel because you are leading people to hell and this teacher should then also be deserved of that. And then there's the second thing that the Bible says about it. The second one may shock you a little bit, but let me just read it to you. 1 Corinthians 16, 22. Paul says, if anyone does not love the Lord, let that person be cursed. If a person does not love the Lord, he says, let him be cursed. That literally, from the original language, means let him go to hell. Because the truth is that's exactly where they're going. So my prayer has been that you have received gospel clarity. And I just want to challenge you and encourage you for the closing. Whatever the Holy Spirit has taught you today, revealed to you today, convicted you today, would you be obedient to the voice of the Holy Spirit? See, we don't want to just be knowers. We want to be actual doers. Would you do it? If you have never been saved, you may have thought you have been, but you never saw, were introduced to the true gospel of grace. Today's a great day to be saved. Believe and repent. And if you are here and you say, well, I know I'm saved, but I have definitely drifted away from the truth of the gospel of grace at times. Repent. Turn back to the truth. Don't let stuff block your mind, your focus, your life, your vision, where it causes you to drift away from the true gospel of grace. And if you say, man, that's exactly, you described me, pastor. That's why we gather as a body, to worship the Lord, praise him, thank him, glorify him, give him honor and praise, because we are so thankful, so grateful. You know, the Bible says people around us will know that we are God's children by the way we love each other. That can only happen if we obey God's commands. And the Bible says we will obey God's commands. That's the result of the gospel. And if we don't, he says we are liars. And the, and the truth is not in us. So whatever the Spirit of God reveals to you this morning, would you be obedient to the voice of of the Holy Spirit. And do just whatever the Spirit of God teaches you. Let us pray. Father God, we are so thankful for your word. We are so thankful for clarity. We are so thankful that you, you show us your way so we can be freed. We are so thankful that you also, when you set us free, you set us free indeed. 
we're so thankful that we can live in the freedom. We can live with now a different desire. We can now live with a different power in us. And that is to do what is pleasing to you. But Father God, we are human beings. And sometimes we may be so focused and occupied of other things around us. And we have a different vision and focus. And we believe we got the true gospel living through us. But we drift away, God. And today as we have seen gospel clarity, I pray that we will turn through the, to you once again afresh and anew and that we will walk in the gospel of grace and that your the gospel can produce exactly what you call us and your word that it will do and that it will produce a righteousness in us that will produce in us that we will obey your commands we will obey your word we will not just know it, but we will actually do it and i pray that you will bless us as you say in your word that then if we do this then your love has truly been made complete in us father god that is our desire that is our longing and would you just help us to do what's honoring to you that and where we need to repent that we would repent and if there's people that have never truly had salvation that they would believe by faith and repent and i pray that you will make us a blessing and that you will guide us and lead us and we leave today and that you will just live through us and that we will do what is pleasing to you in jesus name